Have you ever wondered how your favorite video games create cool visual effects like this screen warping energy ball or this water distortion and reflection effect? Well, these effects are all made possible by shaders, which in simple terms are instructions that we send to the GPU so that it can complete rendering computations. Of course, there are also compute shaders, which are an attempt to harness the GPU's computation power for more irregular processes such as physics simulations. In this video, I decided to spend a whole week of time learning how to write shader effects inside of the Bevy game engine. For those of you who don't know, Bevy is a minimalistic, editorless open source game engine that uses the programming language Rust and an entity component system to create what I believe is one of the most elegant engine infrastructures ever. But first, let's talk about why I'm even going through all the trouble of learning shaders. If we take a step back and look at all the games I've made thus far with Bevy, you'll probably notice that they've been relatively visually unimpressive. This has largely been because I've been avoiding the complexity of actually delving into shader effects ever since I embarked on my game development journey. So in this video, I'm going to be facing my fears and finally delving a little bit deeper into how shaders actually work. So let's get started. The first thing we need to do is create a demo scene inside of Bevy, which we can then add some shaders into to experiment with. So I began to make some pixel art assets for the game, starting off with a tile map. You can see at the start that I'm creating some grass tiles for the game. However, I quickly realized that I suck at color theory, so I just grabbed this color palette off of low spec and rolled with it. After I was done creating the tile map texture, I decided to get to work creating this player sprite. It took some time since I hadn't made pixel art in a pretty long time, but eventually we had a player sprite which I then exported as a sprite sheet so that we could use it inside of the actual game. Then, using the tile map texture, I made a basic level inside the tile map editor tile. To actually create the demo scene in game, I decided to use a crate called Bevy ECS Tile Map, which allows rendering tile maps to be more abstracted. I still needed to write some extra code to parse my tile map from tiled, but that wasn't too difficult as I used the same process in one of the other games that I'm developing, Sewer Oasis. After porting some platformer controller code over to the latest version of Bevy, we had a basic platformer game scene which we could experiment with by adding shaders to later. With the demo scene complete, we can actually begin writing some shaders. I wanted to get started with a simple shader which I was already familiar with, as I had never written any shaders with Bevy before. The only notable shader which I attempted to go in depth with was this water shader, which I had attempted to learn back when I was using the framework mono game. Because of my lack of knowledge, I decided to take a step back and write the shader in an external tool before porting it to the actual game. So I wrote the shader on this website called Shader Toy, which allowed real-time updates to a shader which I could then use to tweak stuff until it seemed right. Most of the shaders which I go over in this video are posted public on my Shader Toy profile. So if any of you are curious, you should definitely go follow that, I'll link that in the description. And while you're in the description, go subscribe to this channel as well. Anyway, back to the video. At first, I went in without looking back at my old code and created this dizzying effect. It doesn't exactly look like water and I got a bit stuck so I looked back at my old code and after tweaking it to have reflection and an outline at the surface of the water, we had a simple water shader. It could definitely be improved but I think it's pretty good for a first time water shader. Let's actually go over how this shader works. For those of you who aren't interested, you can just skip this part. The shader on screen right now is an example of a fragment shader, which basically deals with processing what is actually being rendered on screen. Specifically, it modifies the individual pixels that we see on screen, as opposed to the vertex shader which deals more so with math and geometry. The core of this shader are these two lines which basically displace our UV coordinates by a sine wave that takes in the current UV coordinate as a parameter. The UV modifies what part of the image we are sampling. So the image would appear to be distorted if we displace the UV coordinates by a sine wave, creating the ripples that are present in real life. After this, we just check to see if the part of the image is actually underwater before changing the UV coordinate to this displaced version of the UV coordinate, also applying a reflection by changing the Y component of the UV to reflect over the surface of the water. Finally, we just check to see if the current UV is part of the surface of the water, depending on an outline thickness tolerance and change the color to what our outline color is set to. I might not have worded that whole explanation too well, but I think you get the point. The code is also on my shader toy page, so you guys can check it out even without my crappy explanations. To add the shader into Bevy, you first need to port the shader from the shader language GLSL, which shader toy uses, to WGSL, which is the main shader language that 
works with Bevy. Bevy also does work with GLSL, but I'm not sure how buggy that feature is, so I'm just willing to stick to WGSL. So I looked up a shader example for Bevy since I hadn't really done anything with shaders before. To summarize, we basically render the unprocessed image of the scene onto a screen texture and modify that texture with the shader. I was surprised at how simple it was to pass uniform parameters and such into the shader, but due to my inexperience, I'm probably doing everything the wrong way anyway. But in the end, we were able to completely port the water shader into the game. And I do believe it made our game world seem a lot more real and alive. I'd also like to add that the first iteration of the water shader looked like this. And you can see that everything is upscaled to the native resolution and it doesn't look very pixelated. But after using some render target ordering magic, we were able to get a pixelated look and also a pixel perfect camera that was sort of a side effect of doing that. Okay, now that we've figured out how to do simple stuff like water with shaders, let's try something a bit more complicated. What I have in mind is an energy ball type sort of effect. You might recognize this effect from the start of the video, and this is indeed the main highlight of the video, as I did spend quite a lot of time researching how to do this. We are going to start out in Shader Toy and prototype what the effect is going to look like at its core. Unfortunately, I don't really have a recording of myself actually writing the shader, because I wrote this shader throughout the course of an entire week by slowly chipping away at it bit by bit. Rest assured though that writing this shader does not take a whole week of time. I could probably do it in one day with the concentrated effort, but I decided that taking it slow would be more advantageous than just diving at it all at once. The title of this video might be a bit false in this regard, as the total time that I spent on this project was under a week, but I did sprinkle the project throughout a longer time frame so as not to get burnt out or tired. Alright, now let's get into how this shader actually works. Just a warning for all of you, this explanation is extremely long because I'm going to basically be explaining all the details of this shader in full depth. For those of you who aren't interested and just want to see the results, feel free to skip this section. Code for all the shaders are on my shader toy page, so you guys can also go see it in all of its messiness by clicking the link in the description. Shader might seem a bit complicated when first looking at the code, but we can separate it into two parts. First part is responsible for the energy tendrils which pulse from the ball which actually take up most of the shader because they're a lot more complicated to implement. The second part of the shader is just the rendering of the ball shape which makes up the core of this shader. Let's take a look at the first portion of the shader. The first notable part of this shader is the outer for loop, which loops until we've gone through all the energy tendrils. Within this loop, we first specify how many nodes should be part of an energy tendril, basically how many points will be connected to form a tendril. Additionally, we find the angle that the tendril first shoots off of and the origin of the tendril. Other parameters such as the thickness of the tendril at the start can also be specified during this path. These should in theory be randomly generated, but it should be noted that there doesn't seem to be a random function anywhere in this code. That is because it is impractical to make a real random function on the GPU. Also, it's pretty important that values stay the same throughout your entire shader between different frames because data is not retained between frames for normal shaders. So a pseudo random function is used where we take the fractional portion of a trig function which we feed a seed into which is then additionally randomized with the addition of these random constants which it is multiplied by. Now this is just for normal shaders. Compute shaders run by writing data to an image and reading the color of the image to for example run a particle or physics simulation. This bypasses the restriction of not being able to save data between frames a bit by reading an image and this allows for the ability to performantly simulate stuff like physics on the GPU. But that stuff is a little too complicated for what we're trying to do now, so we're not going to be delving into that. It would make for a good video in the future, so don't be surprised if one of the next uploads is about compute shaders in Bevy. We then make another loop to render and modify the tendrils that shoot off the origin point of each tendril. We basically oscillate them with a sine wave to make the tendrils seem more dynamic and actually like electricity volts. You're probably noticing that sine waves and trigonometric functions are extremely prevalent in shader effects at this point both to generate the actual effect and to create pseudo-random hashing functions. Math is actually a very important part of writing shaders and a good foundation is essential to even writing simple shaders like this one. Some older computers don't support for loops which contain variable lengths. So instead of looping through the total amount of tendril nodes, we just break out of the loop once we've hit the amount of tendrils and first loop through the max amount of tendrils. Then we have to add some code to generate the tendril positions. It should also be noted that we're basically recalculating these positions every frame which can be a pretty expensive operation. This is again because data is not retained between frames in the shader. We can kind of get away with this because of the fact that the GPU is just so fast, but there is probably a better way to do it. I think a lot of people would probably use a compute shader to accomplish this effect, 
as the tendrils seem sort of like particles. But I have zero experience with that as a shader newbie, so we aren't going to be doing that in this video. And the final step after doing all these calculations is to actually draw the tendrils, which is done using a line drawing algorithm which I wrote in this common file on the left. We need to use some linear algebra to find the distance between the current UV coordinate being considered for color changes and the closest point on the line which we're trying to draw. And once we get this distance, we're able to determine just how much color should be added to the pixel that we're considering changing the color of. This should hopefully put into perspective just how quick the GPU is, because every pixel basically needs to perform a calculation like this to draw a singular line. That means given a 1920 by 1080 image, more than 2 million calculations need to be done in order to draw that line. The fact that we're drawing about 600 lines in our shader should show you the power of the GPU and how much it can be harnessed when a capable programmer writes a shader. Of course, the shader I wrote is extremely unoptimized, so take whatever I say with a grain of salt. Now that all the complicated explanations are done, we can move on to the bottom which is really messy so I won't really walk you through this part like I did with the first step of rendering tendrils. Just know that we're basically drawing a bunch of smooth circles with a smooth step function and finally adding on a layer of smoothed over normal noise to make the ball look more detailed. Okay that was a lot of explaining and now that the shader is working we need to actually port the shader into our game. This all might seem like it wasn't too much work and would totally be doable in less than a week because I probably only go over 3 shaders throughout this entire video. But seeing just how complicated the process of making a shader for an energy ball is, should put into perspective how hard it is for beginners to graphics programming like me to get into. Alright, back to porting the shader to Bevy. I had to do some pretty shaky programming to get this to work in Bevy, because I did not yet know how to project UVs into our world frame. The shader would appear pretty large on screen and I needed a way to scale it down without messing with any of the other parameters that make the shader work. The easiest way to do this was definitely just scaling the UV coordinates down which would scale everything else accordingly. So I made a lot of weird uniform variables that are probably not needed in this context. I won't try to spread bad habits by explaining this part to you, but in the end the energy ball was successfully added into the game and after making a little animation for our player, I was able to demonstrate a possible use case of the shader inside of the final working video game. Okay, something final that I want to get to work on is the post-processing effect. Post-processing effects are basically ways to get your game to look a little better after rendering all the core assets. It isn't so different from what we've been doing so far, but I just want to get it working for the sake of practicing how to make shaders. I originally wanted to make a bloom effect, which is the glow that you often see in video games. The process seemed pretty cool. You find the light parts of an image that exceed a certain level and just apply a blur filter to those light parts. I never knew it was so simple. But Bevy already has its own implementation so I decided to go for another effect. That being film grain. I'm also kind of glad I didn't have to write a more complicated effect though because all it takes is a simple understanding of pseudo random algorithms to write a simple passable grain effect. So I went into shader toy and this time because the effect was so simple, it only took me about 15 minutes to write up a prototype of this shader. Basically we just add a randomized color with a randomized strength to every pixel on screen. This random operation should be pretty familiar at this point if you paid attention to the previous rant about the energy ball shader. Anyway, after porting it to WGSL, our shader journey is finally at an end. I toned down the strength of the effect a bit so as not to make the game look weird. I'm not sure if you can actually see the effect in case YouTube has compressed it too much, but it was indeed working on my side of things. I hope you all enjoyed this wild journey of a video. If this video was helpful or interesting, make sure you drop a like on the video and subscribe. I'll be seeing you guys in the next one.